ducks rolled aboard by the score, loaded with fuel and other vital cargo so that they could dash ashore as soon as the ships arrived at Thule. Along went 3,500 men of the Engineer Signal and Transportation Corps and other military specialists, plus the bulk of civilian workmen. On June 6, 1951, the Great Armada steamed out of Norfolk and headed north. Eighty-two ships carrying a cargo valued at $125 million. A long, cold voyage lay ahead. A voyage that would become increasingly hazardous as the thin-skinned ships penetrated the vast ice fields that surrounded Blue Jay like a belt of frozen fortifications hundreds of miles in depth. Danger loomed in the form of icebergs the size of dreadnoughts. Pack ice like floating minefields that opened reluctantly in front and closed silently behind. The sea became a floor of ice from horizon to horizon. The convoy halted, held fast in the ice pack. For days, the ships struggled to free themselves from their frozen trap. Not only was the time schedule disrupted, but the ships and the men aboard them were endangered by the ice that squeezed them in a giant vice. It was only through the stubborn efforts of the Coast Guard icebreakers that the convoy was finally liberated. Pressing down with their heavy-jawed bows, the icebreakers battered at the tremendous ice flows four and five feet thick, hacking, crushing, grinding away. The icebreakers smashed a trail for the convoy to follow. Helicopters soared aloft on reconnaissance, scouting far ahead for signs of open water. Slowly, day by day, mile by mile, the ships crept forward until on July 9th, the fleet finally steamed into North Star Bay at Thule. A voyage that would normally have been made in about two weeks had taken more than twice that long. At least two precious weeks had been lost from the brief construction season. This lost time had to be made up somehow. The ships had hardly anchored off Thule when control headquarters aboard the command ship Monrovia raced into high gear to get the convoy unloaded. Soldiers of the Army's Engineer and Transportation Corps went to work in a round-the-clock stevedoring operation. Cargo from the freighters was swung onto Navy landing craft, manned by over 1,000 seamen. Unloading equipment had long been prepared for split-second action, everything from a giant floating crane to swarms of amphibious ducks that skimmed back and forth across the water, dodging the crushing ice. Two battalions of ducks were in constant use. A great deal of the credit for the speedy unloading belongs to these highly efficient seagoing freight cars. They quickly build up a vast stockpile of fuel and oil for Blue Jays' hundreds of machines. At the water's edge, the Navy's Beachmaster Control avoided traffic jams and delays by setting up a smooth traffic pattern to regulate the movement of supplies as they poured ashore. In a matter of hours, the frigid waters of Thule Harbor were transformed into a great port, crowded with Navy landing craft transferring cargo from ship to shore in a steady, unceasing rhythm of unloading. Unloading went on through rain squalls and wind. Over 153,000 long tons of cargo were eventually delivered on the beach. Work crews 4,000 strong were ferried to land from their temporary homes aboard five personnel carriers. They operated in two shifts, 60% in the first or day shift, 40% in the second shift. As the heavy earth-moving equipment lumbered off the LSTs, Men and machines went right to work. In bad weather as well as good, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
Dirt flew in all directions as quarries were mined with high explosives. Then dug for rock and earth fill needed at the construction sites for airstrip, roads, fuel tanks, hangars, barracks, and other buildings. First objective was the giant airstrip with its main runway, aprons, and taxiways. To level it off along all its tremendous length, it had to be cut down in some areas and built up in others, sometimes as much as 40 feet. Layer upon layer of fill was dumped upon the runway. Smoothed down and packed tight by 100-ton compaction machines. Batteries of rock crushers poured out mountains of broken stone. This was hauled to the runway and spread evenly upon the ground. Hot liquid asphalt was sprayed upon the stones to bind them together. A layer of fine gravel followed, which was brushed to smooth it down then rolled to compress the several layers into a solid mass. The nearly completed airstrip received one of its first tests from two key visitors on August 8th. General Hoyt Vandenberg, chief of the Air Force, who had come to check construction progress, with General Lewis Pick, chief of engineers. Only two and a half months were left to work in but the generals found construction moving swiftly on all fronts. In some cases, even breaking records. The fuel tanks, for example. An earth pad of gravel or rock fill that would not be affected by frost was laid down for each tank and sprayed with oil to bind it. A floor of steel plate followed. Then the walls. These iron workers were specialists who had put up similar tanks everywhere throughout the world. The vast fuel receptacles were nicknamed POL tanks, an abbreviation of their contents, petroleum, oil, lubricant. Specialists did not stand by between assignments. They helped others. For instance, welders helped guide the steel plate into position, making sure it was lined up properly. Then took up the torch. Work went on into the twilight hours of the midnight sun, which during the Arctic summer never set below the horizon. Rigging the pipeline that ran to the tankers more than a mile away was a construction feat in itself. A suspension rig was built to carry it across a 50-foot chasm. The pipeline lunged across ditches and ravines, sometimes quivering in midair until it reached the bay, where, like a water snake, it swam out to the tanker and reared its head alongside. Construction of all kinds was booming. The icy ground under each building was first insulated by an earth pad. The foundations for the airplane hangars were strengthened by setting piles into the ground along the edges of each pad to provide a firm base for the hangar frame and doors. The piles were reinforced by filling in with dirt that would eventually freeze into a solid mass. Culvert pipe was laid across each pad. Cold air circulating through it would carry off the heat seeping through the hangar floor and prevent it from weakening the frozen foundation. The secret of Arctic construction was to make use of the everlasting permafrost, not work against it. The exposed pipe was buried in dry fill. Concrete was poured for the floor, followed by an insulating layer of four-inch slabs of foam glass, additional insurance that hangar heat would not melt the frozen earth below. These slabs were covered by a second layer of concrete which was given a finished surface and cured under tarpaulins with hot air blowers to keep it from freezing. <laughs> 